In today's lecture, we're going to start talking about matrix population models. This is not always everyone's favorite topic in population ecology. This is a bit of a daunting topic, but we're going to tackle it in the following way. In this video, we're going to go through the rationale for using matrix population models. In the next video, I'll talk a little bit more, I'll talk through a demo of using matrix population models of putting a transition matrix together and, and projecting populations forward using a matrix population modeling approach. And in lab four, we will really get down and dirty with matrix population models. So hopefully by the end of this lecture and lab four, you will really have a handle on matrix population models. But don't feel bad if you don't fully understand matrix population models by the end of this lab, but I want you to of this lab, this lecture. But what I do want you to have a handle on is the rationale for why we use matrix population models and why they are so cool. Just also know that uh, this material is, is also covered in Gotelli's chapter three. So please read through chapter three, make sure you understand. Um, hopefully between the lectures and the Gotelli book, um, it should all become clear. So don't be too afraid. Hopefully we can uh, walk you through this and it won't be too difficult. Before we get started with matrix population models, I just wanted to point out that the midterm exam is coming up on March 15. Um, you'll have the whole class period to take the exam. Um, it'll be online of course, and administered on Top Hat. So we're going to use the Top Hat exam uh, format. And um, hopefully, you know, I'll go through the, the format in more detail coming up, but I wanted to make sure you, you have a heads up in terms of what is expected and what will be covered on the exam. So that being said, the, the exam will cover everything from uh, through chapters one through three in the Gatelli book. That is basic exponential growth, density dependent population growth, logistic population growth, and age structured populations and matrix population modeling. So that's what will be covered uh, from the Gatelli book. All material covered in lectures up to and including this lecture on matrix population models will be included in the exam and all material covered in labs one through four. So again, the material is basically just exponential population growth, um, logistic population growth, density dependence, and um, you know, the, obviously the, the Ali effect and that kind of thing is a reverse or positive density dependence and matrix population models and age structured populations, life tables, that kind of thing. So that's the material. It should be fairly straightforward in terms of what's going to be covered. Um, you should also review chapter one of Beyond Connecting the Dots and the Systems Thinking Lecture. So, uh, you know, you can review the ideas that we covered in terms of why we, we think in terms of systems, why we use stock and flow diagrams to represent populations, and concepts like equilibria, stable equilibria, unstable equilibria. Um, I'll provide a little more detail on the key concepts um, that you should review. But in the meantime, get started with uh, reviewing these materials, and making sure you understand the key concepts. I will also potentially include some basic programming constructs that we have used in class. So uh, for loops and if then else statements are fair game because we have gone over them in some detail in class. So I want to make sure that everyone is comfortable with the very basics of computer programming in R, although I won't uh, quiz you or test you on, on um, any R syntax. Uh, you don't have to know exactly how to write a for loop in R or an if then else statement. That's okay. I, I know you can look that stuff up. I don't need you to memorize that. But um, I do want you to be familiar with the concept of using an if then else statement and a for loop basically harnessing the power of computers in order to make our lives easier as ecologists, as scientists, and uh, to learn about systems in ways that we otherwise could not. 
So that's what's going to be covered. The exam will be a mixture of multiple choice and short answer questions. Um, I do ask that you have a calculator handy. I mean, you're going to be all be on your laptops anyway, so you'll have a calculator handy anyway. Um, but um, I may ask you to, to try to um, use some of the key equations like the exponential growth equations and the logistic population growth equations in order to solve a problem or two. So that is um, all I wanted to say on the exam. Let's move on. Uh, to the matrix population models concepts. So again, we're going to talk a lot more about this in lab four, but, um, but I just want to get started talking about why we use matrix population models. Um, one key point here is that this lecture and lab four are, are heavy. We're using R and R studio. If you want to follow along in R in R studio, then what I, I would recommend doing is Clicking on this link, I, I would right click or control, command click and open or save the link into a folder. Um, and maybe it's the class folder that you set up earlier in our studio. Um, and so save that script and then load that up in our studio. You can just go to our studio click here and load up the lecture7.r. That's what you just downloaded from the website. And that will take you through the examples that we're using in class. And I can make this a little bit bigger so you can see, see that. So we're gonna walk through some of that code later in this lecture. Let's head back here um, and let's get started. So why do we use population matrices or transition matrices. Why do we use matrix population models? It sounds complicated. It involves some higher level mathematics. Why do it? Well, one of the reasons is that we can simplify these population models. It makes it a lot easier actually in a strange way to use matrices versus using other uh, ways of representing populations. We see this population, this is a, a version of the the question or the model we built in, in lab three, an age structured population model. This is an insight maker. This isn't a explicitly a matrix population model. This is a this is programmed in insight maker. We have three stocks, one two, age one, two, and three. We have a bunch of flows representing mortality and representing transition from one age to the next. And we have uh, recruitment. We see that age two and age three both contribute new offspring, and so that flow is linked to, to both these, these ages. And this is a nice way to represent it, but as these models get more complicated, as you get more and more stages in here, and you get more and obviously more and more flows, and uh, more and more links, these, these arrows, and they start overlapping, and it becomes harder and harder to put it all together. Now, you can contrast that with just a matrix representation, something like this. Um, and you can see that it can simplify, that, like basically every single flow and uh, transition rate. So all the variables and all the flows that we would put in the insight maker model are just all right here um, in a matrix representation. We'll talk about more about like why we use that, that representation and how to um, how to read this basically, but it it can make our lives much simpler, especially for models that have lots of stages and lots of um, lots of different potential flows between stages. Gatelli gives an example of this um, plant, and plants have can have more complex life histories than animals. For instance, plants can move backwards in life stages, whereas um, that is like they can get smaller potentially <laughs> over time and they can kind of revert to an earlier so-called earlier stage like they might have a flowering stage that can revert back to a rosette stage that can then produce a flowering uh, stage again so it can go back and forth and so plants can be a little bit more complicated. Gatelli includes this example of the teasel um, plant and 
describes the various um, stages that the teasel plant goes through in addition to how uh, teasel individuals can transition from one stage to the next and reproduce. And uh, this is the diagram that Gotelli presents to represent the life history of this plant, the teasel. So we see that there are one, two, three, four, five, six stages. And these, there's a lot of potential transitions between stages. Uh, dormant seeds can become uh, the next stage of dormant seed. They can go in the next year. They can transition to a small rosette. Um, or they could even have a small chance of transitioning into a large rosette. And so you have a lot of potential transitions here. It's getting a little bit complicated in order you start to see how many arrows there are here. If you tried to implement this in Insight Maker, it would be relatively difficult. You could do it, but it would be relatively difficult. But um, you, can trans you can translate this figure, this, these, these um, numbers here, parameters, into a matrix representation that is much, much easier to uh, represent this population and if you can understand how to read a population transition matrix um, it's relatively straightforward so what we see here is that this um, seed uh, one stage for instance which we were just looking at can transition to the second year seed stage all right uh, you have a 96 percent chance of transitioning from seed one to seed two. So any, all seed one individuals in the population have a 96% chance of transitioning to seed two in the next year. So that's that's how we can start interpreting this matrix. We're gonna go over this in much more detail in lab four, but this is a sneak peek. So these numbers just represent transition rates from whatever the column is to whatever the row is. So this rosette one stage, if you're in the rosette one stage this year, you have a 12.5% chance of being in the rosette one stage next year. And if you're in the flowering stage this year, you could produce on average 322 seeds in the following year, all right? So we'll talk more about how to interpret it, but this is a much simpler representation than we would be able to get, than this, this diagram itself, or what this model would look like if we tried to implement it in Insight Maker. All right, so the first reason that we use transition matrices and population matrices um, is just for the simplicity of it. It enables us to simplify complex life histories into a single matrix that represents all the potential transitions from one stage, one life history stage, or age, like age one to age two. It represents transitions from one life history stage or age to the next. So relatively straightforward and easy to represent. So that's reason number one. What's reason number two? Well, reason number two is uh, projection, all right? That means we can easily project the uh, population abundance in every one of our life history stages um, this year into the next year. Just makes it really, really easy, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, but I wanted to quickly uh, go through one, one aside, and th this is the idea of age structure versus stage structure. And Gatelli talks about this too, but I just wanted to um, make sure that this concept makes sense to you. Um, we, in the previous lecture and in lab three, we talked about age structured populations. And we meant that the population vital rates, the little b and little d, are not constant through the life history of the individuals that we're interested in, but in fact change as they age, right? So th that's what we mean by, by age structure. But sometimes it's convenient to classify individuals within a certain age range as belonging to a particular life history stage. So we can say something like, and let's take the grizzly bear as an example, we might classify their life history into these four stages. First, you have 
newborns, age one, age zero to one. And then you have yearlings in those in their second year of life. And then we have anyone in their third, fourth, fifth, sixth year of life in the subadult age class. And then anything older is the uh, adult stage. And so we now have taken, you know, a life history that that might go up to potentially 12, 15 years of age. And we've simplified it into only four stages. And those stages are where we think there are key differences in the population vital rates, the birth rate and the death rate. We have classified these four stages because we think basically if you're in the newborn stage, your birth and death rates are fairly constant among all the individuals who are newborns. Yearlings have relatively constant birth and death rates. Subadults, if you're between two and five years of age, then you're going to have similar survival rates. You're going to have similar fecundities, probably zero birth rate. And then when you're adult, finally, you can start giving birth. And if you're an adult, you tend to survive with a certain probability. So you don't need to necessarily subdivide the population into individuals who are uh, three years old, four years old, five years old, six years old. You can just simplify into a certain number of stages. So that's what we mean by a stage-structured population instead of an age-structured population. All right, so that's really, they're very similar models, but stage structured populations can allow us to even further simplify our population models. Um, we can consider a species like a sea turtle that can potentially live up to 75 or 100 years. Um, you can build a model where there's 100 stocks, but that gets kind of tedious, right? Or you can maybe subdivide the life history of this species into, say, five uh, stages, all right? Life history stages. Maybe it's hatchlings in the first year of life, young juveniles from, year, from age one to five, older juveniles from age five to 10, subadults from age 10 to 17 or something like that, and then anything older than 18, 18 or older, older is classified as an adult. So by using stages, we've simplified our model from having 100 stocks with even more flows and transitions. So it's really a complex model to a model with only five stocks. And we're still capturing the key elements of how vital rates change with age. So the model is still biologically realistic and it's a, a whole lot simpler and less likely to introduce errors that are really hard to find. So we tend to use stage structured populations in most cases and I think probably most of you in your final projects are going to be using something like a, a stage structure versus uh, a, an age structured model. But you're welcome to use either approach. Sometimes age structured models are actually easier and more appropriate. So, and just a quick aside, um, you won't be tested on this but the idea of the Leslie matrix, you may have heard the Leslie matrix before. It's probably the most common type of um, matrix population model that we talk about. The Leslie matrix refers to an age structured population matrix. That is every year of life gets its own stage and you can only transition from Say if you're a one-year-old, you could only transition to it being a two-year-old. You can't transition back. You can't go backwards in age. So Leslie matrix is a very constrained version of a matrix population model where every stage represents uh, strictly a, an age class. So that is a one-year-old, a two-year-old, a three-year-old, so on and so forth. Stage matrices that are not Leslie matrices, that is something like the Teasel matrix we just looked at, that is often called a, a Lefkovich matrix because it's a much more flexible technique. Now you have each of these um, stocks or, you know, in the population, these, these uh, stages represent particular life history stages that could represent many different ages. And in fact, like we said here, you can go from a flowering stage back into a rosette stage potentially. And 
Um, you can do all sorts of <laughs> crazy things with matrices as long as it, as long as you can justify, you know, if you are a say rosette individual of stage two rosette in this case, um, in this year, what can you transition to next year? And in this case, you have a 23% chance of transitioning to, uh, of staying in the rosette two stage, and then a 24.5% chance of, of transitioning to the next stage. A small chance of becoming a flowering plant or a flowering individual, reproductive individual in the next stage. Um, so uh, there can be all sorts of transitions that are possible in a stage structured population model. You're not as constrained as you are with an age structured Leslie matrix. So hopefully that makes sense, uh, the difference between stage structure and age structure. Um, it's kind of a further simplification that allows us to, uh, to build uh, population models that are biologically realistic and yet don't have an insane number of stocks and flows, for instance. All right, so getting back to reason two for uh, using matrix population models, reason one was just the simplicity. Reason two is that matrix population models make our lives easier in terms of being able to project the population from year one to year two and year two to year three. So to actually make uh, project, projections about the abundance of individuals in each stage or age class across a, many, many years potentially. So um, we saw in lab three that life tables are a good way of representing popula uh, representing how birth and death rates change or across the, the age uh, of individuals in a cohort. It's a good way of representing age structured populations in general, but it's not very good for projecting. I think we had one question in lab three where you're asked to use a life table to project the age structure of a population one time step in the future, just one time step in the future. And was that a simple task? No, not really. You really had to put some thought into how you can take the information in the life table to to take uh, you know the number of individuals in each life history stage or or age in this year and project that into the next year. Um, it wasn't that simple, and it's not that straightforward. And um, contrasting that with how easy and straightforward it is to project populations. Uh, using matrix population models is really eye-opening. So that's reason number two for using matrix population models. Um, and let's go into R for a couple minutes and I can show how easy it is to use R or to use matrix population models, whether you're using R or Excel or whatever you're using, to use matrix population models to project abundances. So let's go into R and this is where you know you could follow along. Um, let me just point out that the Teasel matrix is provided for you in right here. So it says where, for example, the Teasel vital rates can be summarized in this matrix. If you click on that, save this to the same folder where you uh, you have your R Studio project, where you're storing all the data and R files uh, for this class. Um, you can then load that up in our studio. So make sure you save this, save this link to your class folder. Um, and so make sure that you have this, this uh, file called teaselmatrix1.csv. CSV stands for comma separated values. It's a common format for reading data into R. All right, so let's go into R. And we're in the lecture7.r uh, file or R script here. Make this a little bigger. And all right, I can get rid of other things so that I start off with a blank R Studio. Basically, this is just the script I just loaded. Nothing in my environment, nothing in my plot window right now. And if I want to, I can just remove everything. Just click on that sweeping icon, the, the broom icon. All right, so now I can read in the Teasel matrix using this read CSV function. 
and uh, remember everything preceded by a pound sign or hashtag is a comment, so R doesn't really do anything with it, but it's a way for us to to, to tell ourselves or any anybody else who's using the code what we're doing. Um, all right, so I remove the, the row names essentially. Um, I'm just making a, a matrix. It doesn't really matter what exactly is happening here. I'm not gonna go through it in great detail, but what we end up with in this code is a matrix that we call a projection matrix that represents the different transition rates from one stage to the next. So if you're in a rosette one stage this year, you have a 12.5 chance of staying rosette one or a 12.5 chance percent chance of, of moving on to the next rosette stage, rosette two stage. So that's the matrix and that's that was reason or rationale number one for using matrix population models that simplifies our lives. Now let's think about projection. So in order to project this population, which we're gonna do more in lab four, take this, um, we need some, uh, some initial abundances for each of the stages. So we give some initial abundances. We'll say there's 1,000 uh, seed one stage, 1,500 seed two stage, 200 rosette one, 300 rosette two, um, let's, uh, yeah, and then rosette three, and then there's the flowering stage. So we initialize it. And so basically what we're doing is we're just making a, a, a vector of initial abundances, all right? So for each of the stages, we have the number of individuals that start off our simulation in that stage, all right? So what I wanted to demonstrate is how easy it is to take that initial abundance, this right here, and to update the abundance. If we consider that to be year zero, now we have year one abundance. All we have to do is take the Tiesel matrix and then matrix multiply that by our initial abundance. Don't feel like you have to understand matrix multiplication. We're gonna go over that in lab four, but for now, I just wanna show how easy it is. So if you, t if you matrix multiply the projection matrix by the initial abundance vector, what we get is the abundance, the simulated or projected abundance in year one. And you could do the same thing for year two. So now you, you make year one represent you know, the current year. And so to update to year two, we take the projection matrix and we matrix multiply it by the abundance this year and we get next year's abundances. And we're, we're already seeing some crazy exponential growth in this model, but that is just what I wanted to show in terms of how easy it is. We're talking one easy line of code in R to project the population from one year to the next. And of course, we can use a for loop if we want to project multiple years. So if I wanted to project 10 years of population growth in this population, I might initialize a storage array to store the, the abundance of every, in every stage in every year that I wanna make a projection for. So I can initialize this, and I also would probably um, initialize the uh, year zero, so we, we had to specify the number of individuals in the population at the initial, at the very start of our simulation. So what we have is this vector, or sorry, we have a matrix where um, we filled in year zero, but we're gonna fill in the abundance in each stage for year one, two, three, four, all the way to year 10, all right? And all we have to do to do that is to run a for loop. And the for loop is relatively simple. We're gonna loop through just like we did in the lab one where we had exponential growth uh, that we were simulating from um, you know, the initial year zero all the way to a certain number of years. We're gonna do 10 years here. Um, and for every, every time we loop through, we're gonna fill in one more column here that represents the abundances in year one, the abundances of all stages in year two, three, four, all the way to 10. 
we can just run that loop and now we have simulated the teasel population starting at year zero and going all the way to year 10. All right. Going back to the lecture page. Um, so we've just gone through rationale number two, projection. We, there is a third reason that we use matrix population models or that we, matrix population models are so useful for population ecologists. And that is <laughs> um, something that don't feel like you have to totally understand right now, but it's called, it, it involves matrix algebra or linear algebra tricks. And when I say tricks, I mean, well, we can take that projection matrix and we can get some pretty important population parameters from that matrix using some tricks of, of linear algebra. So let's go through what we mean by that. First of all, there's a really clear similarity between the finite population growth equation or the discrete population growth equation. Remember, you, to get the abundance next year in, our, in an exponentially growing population, in a discrete population model, you take the previous year abundance and you multiply it by lambda. All right, we, we know that it represents popu exponential population growth in a discrete way. Um, let's look at the matrix population equation. You take the abundance of all your life history stages or ages uh, next year to, to compute next year's abundance in all your stages, you take the previous year abundance of you know all the different stages that um, that you're using to represent your population, and you multiply it by a the transition matrix. That's the matrix we've just been talking about. Um, so n this time is not just a single number. But it's a whole set of numbers. It's a, it's a set of numbers representing, say, juveniles, subadults, and adults. So you've, you're now breaking. This is the age structure or stage structure we're talking about. We're structuring the population by age class or stage. All right. So instead of being just a single number like we did in Lab One, we're representing n that just represents the total number of individuals in the population. We're not differentiating by age at that point. That's the only difference between this equation from lab one and from our first lecture and this equation which is a matrix population um, growth all right so to get the abundance next year you take the previous abundance and you multiply it by the matrix and this where these ends represent vectors of abundances that is the abundance for all the different stages you can obviously see the similarities these are these are they look very similar both equations describe exponential growth or decline, all right? Um, we've seen this in the age-structured population labs and the previous lecture, where when we simulate an age-structured population model, it tends to maybe jump around for the first few years, but then exhibits smooth population growth going forward, whether it's growing exponentially or declining exponentially. But at a certain point, once it reaches what we call the stable age distribution, the population, like all the different stages and the total population, are either growing exponentially or declining exponentially. All right. So both of these equations describe exponentially growing or declining populations. All right. Just that one is age structured or, or stage structured, this one, and, and one is not. All right, now I promised some matrix tricks. What are those? Well, the first one is that we can compute lambda from the transition matrix A. Lambda, in the case of a, of a matrix population model, is that rate of growth that is achieved when the population is at stable age distribution. That smooth population growth or decline, that is constant across uh, time steps, um, that rate of growth is called lambda. It's totally analogous to the lambda that we saw in the discrete population growth model 
with that is not age structured. So it's it just represents the the multiplicative rate of population growth, but in an age structured or matrix population model, it is the rate of growth that is achieved at stable age distribution. All right. So all we need to do to compute lambda from the transition matrix is to take the first or dominant eigenvalue of the transition matrix. Don't feel like you have to understand what that means, but it's a, it's a fairly straightforward thing that you can do in R. And don't even if you don't understand it, what you do or should be able to understand is that in one fell swoop, one simple step, you can compute the intrinsic rate of growth of the population, the discrete multiplicative rate of growth, lambda of the population, at stable age distribution anyway, from the, the, the stage matrix, the transition matrix, really easily. One line of code and you can get it done, all right? And the second cool trick that we can do is we can compute the stable age distribution uh, from the transition matrix in one fell swoop. The same way, this time it's the right hand or the right eigenvector of the transition matrix. Don't feel like you have to understand what that means. But again, it's one line of code, relatively easy to implement, and it makes it easy to compute a really important population parameter, the stable age distribution, directly from the transition matrix. All right. So if we go into R, we can see this in action. So here in this one line of code, we're going to take the dominant eigenvalue of the Tiesel matrix and that is lambda. So here we're going to take the Tiesel matrix, run this code, and from that compute lambda just in one, one easy line of code. So yeah, you might have to take a linear algebra class to, to learn more about eigenvalues and eigenvectors, but it's not critical that you understand that in order to make use of it in population ecology. So these tips of, or these tricks of matrix algebra allow us to do some pretty cool things with matrix population models. Um, you can also harness a package called PopBio. It makes life easier um, rather than knowing how to uh, use base R to compute this eigenvalue of the matrix and, and get the lambda value. You can use pop bio and make your life even easier. And now there's a function called lambda that is provided by the pop bio package. When you load a, a library or a package, what it does is it adds functionality to R. So now we have new functions we can use, and one of those functions is called lambda. We give the lambda function this Tiesel matrix as input. So you know it's a function when you see this parenthesis, open and close parenthesis, um, after some object. That's the way R uh, functions work. You, you give the name of the function, then open parenthesis, and then all the arguments to the function, that is the inputs. And you give the function some inputs, and the function does something with it and gives you an output. And what this function gives you as output is lambda. And so really easy to use. As long as you load up the pop bio package, you can take any transition matrix and compute lambda really easily. All right. Same thing with stable age distribution. You can use this relatively complex line of code uh, in base R to grab the, um, the right-hand eigenvector of the, um, the Tiesel matrix here, and that gives you the stable age distribution. All right, so we can look at the stable age distribution here, and we see that at stable age distribution, 63% of the population is in the seed one stage, 26% of the population is in the seed two stage, 1.2% of the population is in the rosette one stage, and so on and so forth. All right, so that is the stable age distribution, and we got that simply by just doing a, running a, a single line of code that uses the Tiesel matrix and uh, the it just computes the stable age distribution directly. And of course, the pop bio package makes our life even easier. We can load the pop bio package and then 
use the stable.stage function, give the teasel matrix as input uh, to the function, and the stable stage function does something. It, it takes the, the right eigenvector of the teasel matrix and it, and it outputs that stable age distribution, and it should get the same numbers we just got above, all right? So pretty cool, that's reason number three to use matrix population models. So reason number one was it simplifies an otherwise very complex story that we're trying to tell about how, how populations work and how one life stage can transition to the next. Reason two, it makes projecting from one year to the next really, really easy. And reason three is we can use these tricks of matrix algebra in order to compute things like lambda and stable age distribution that we wouldn't otherwise be able to compute easily. All right, so those are the three reasons. Um, what I'd like you to do now is to pause the video or stop it. This is the end of the video. I, I, I will post another video after this, um, but take a minute before watching the next video, take a minute to answer the top hat question. Does a stage structured population grow at the rate of lambda per time step if it is not at a stage? The stable age distribution. So again, I'm wanting you to think about the stable age distribution and what the meaning of lambda is in a age or stage structured population model. Does the population, does the, the stage one, stage two, stage three, the juveniles, adults, subadults, are they growing at a rate of lambda per year if the population is not at stable age distribution? Of course, we did say that at stable age distribution, we know that all the life history stages will be growing at a rate of lambda per year. What about if the population is not at stable age distribution? Um, this should be relatively straightforward, but again, I just want to drum that point home. So please take a minute to um, look at a stage structured model or load one up in Insight Maker and try to start the population at something outside of stable age, something that's not stable age distribution, and see if it grows in the next year, or in the next year or two, does it grow at a rate of lambda per year? Um, so please answer the top hat question and then move on to the second, to, to the second video. And I will see you there.